So the purpose of today's webinar is threefold. Firstly, we'll look at the reasons why ISO 45001 has been introduced. Then we'll provide you with an overview of what is new in 45001. And lastly, I'll give you an idea of the way forward. So if you're thinking about getting certified to the new standard or how you can migrate from 18 to 45. And just so that we're clear, the information given in this webinar represents the opinions of Battleass Limited and are not endorsed by ISO or any other body. The information is based on the published ISO 45001 2018. Any implementation of new or changes to existing management systems should be made with caution. Okay, so let's get started. So ISO 45001 has been in the making since 2013. And finally, it was published two days ago. At the same time, 18001 was withdrawn. 45001 draws heavily on the British standard 18001, which is a standard used by many of our clients. It's important to say that 45001 is a new standard. It's not an update to 18001. So those already certified to 18001 will, however, be able to migrate to the new standard. And we'll come to this later in the webinar. So many people think of high visibility clothing and warning signs when we talk about health and safety. But I say 45001 for occupational health and safety is so much more than that. So the activities of an organization may pose a risk of illness and injury, sometimes with a fatal outcome to its employers and customers. According to the International Labour Organization, there were 2.34 million deaths in 2013 caused by work activities. And its organizations are responsible to ensure that they minimize the risk of harm to their workers, managers, contractors and visitors. So ISO 45001 has been developed to help organizations manage these occupational health and safety risks. So having a certified management system implemented will help organizations achieve this by implementing preventative measures to eliminate or minimize its occupational health and safety risks. 45001 is intended to be applicable for any organization, so from micro businesses to global conglomerates to integrate aspects of health and safety to prevent injury and ill health to its workers. But let's be clear, it's not a descriptive standard. It doesn't specify criteria, nor does it say how the management system should be designed. So this means a small business with low risk activities can have a relatively simple system, whilst large organizations with high risk activities may need a more sophisticated system. So the standard is open to all. It's not a legally binding document, but a voluntary tool for organizations to showcase their commitment to occupational health and safety. So why do it? So if an organization decides to implement ISO 45001, they will improve their occupational health and safety performance by having a policy with clear objectives in place and by establishing processes taking risks and opportunities into account, as well as legal and other requirements. They will be determining hazards, seeking to control or eliminate them, and have controls in place to manage occupational health and safety risks. It will help build awareness in the organization. Evaluating and improving occupational health and safety performance by taking appropriate actions, by letting workers take an active role in all occupational health and safety matters. But in the bigger picture, this will lead to the organization gaining a reputation for being a safe place to work. And this may lead to improved ability to respond to regulatory compliance issues, reducing costs of incidents, disruption to operations and insurance premiums, reducing downtime, absenteeism and employee turnover, gaining recognition of achieving an international benchmark, satisfying customers who are concerned about social responsibilities. So what's new in 45001? So in the following, in the following, we'll not go through the standard clause by clause like we do in our training courses, but we'll address the main concepts and features of 45001. 
So when it was decided that an Occupational Health and Safety International Management System standard was needed, there were some design specifications that needed to be fulfilled. The standard needed to be in line with other management system standards, such as ISO 9001 and ISO 14001. They were both updated in 2015 around a new structure called Annex SL. And ISO 45001 also adopts this new structure. Annex SL is a high level structure for all new ISO management system standards to be modeled on. That means all ISO management system standards will have the same clause names and numbering independent of which sector the standard is for. The core text will be identical and there will be common terms and definitions across all the resulting standards. IRCA, the International Register of Certified Auditors, says Annex SL is the most significant innovation in management system standards since the introduction of ISO 9001 itself. The purpose of having one structure is to improve the consistency between management standards and to make it easier to run a system where you use more than one standard. Common terms and definitions make them speak the same language and the identical core text contains general management system requirements for all. Sector specific requirements, definitions and text are added to Annex SL clauses to suit the sector the standard is for. So <clears throat> clause four, context of the organisation is a new requirement for occupational health and safety. And it's all about what can impact your management system. So let's explore it in, more, it in more detail. We can't talk about the context of the organization without talking about interested parties. The needs and expectations of interested parties are to be included in the context. But what do we mean by interested parties? So the definition is a person or organization that can affect, be affected by or perceive themselves to be affected by a decision or activity. This definition could potentially include anyone, but let's take a closer look at what it means. Interested parties are the people and organisations who have requirements that are relevant to your management system. You must define them and understand their needs and expectations and decide if they are already are or could become legal or other requirements. For help with this, you can find examples of interested parties listed in the new British standard 45002-2018. This gives a general guidelines for the effective application of ISO 45001. Once you know who your interested parties are, you can determine internal issues that could impact on the outcomes of the management system. This could, for instance, be the skills of your workforce. The organisation must go beyond that and look at external issues like industry sector trends and regulatory demand. These issues can have great impact on the business and its outcomes. You can also go the other way around and determine your issues first, then your interested parties. Whichever way you do it is up to you. But once you have all this in place, you'll be able to determine the context of your organisation further and then determine the scope of your management system. The scope of the management system is not to be confused with the scope of the standard. They're two different things. And in the following, we'll explain the requirements for the management system scope. The organisation must determine the scope or boundaries, if you like, of the management system. The scope is determined using the context of the organisation. It could cover the whole of the organization, one or more departments, one or more locations. The scope is whatever the organization decides they want the system to cover. The scope must include activities, products and services that is under the influence or control of the organization and which impact upon its occupational health and safety performance. And from an occupational health and safety perspective, it's not acceptable to, to subcontract risk without exercising a duty of care. The organisation is responsible for its subcontracted processes and how they're performed. An authentic scope 
will give credibility to the Occupational Health and Safety Management System. It should not mislead interested parties. So another big change in Clause 5 introduced by Annex SL <clears throat> is, what we referred, um, is that we refer to leadership in place of management responsibility. But what's the difference between leadership and management? So a manager and a leader will be different in the way they motivate people. Whilst managers have subordinates, leaders have followers. Managers are authoritarian, task focused and seek, fo seek comfort. Leaders are charismatic with a focus on people and they seek risk. I know this is generalizing a lot, but it gives you an idea. So how does this affect a management system? Well, Clause 5 places specific requirements on top management. So who is top management? The definition, a person or group of people who directs and controls an organization at the highest level. This is where your scope comes into play. If your scope covers the whole organization, then top management is the CEO and the board. However, if your scope covers an individual factory or plant within a group, then top management are the directors or managers of that factory or plant. Leaders have many responsibilities that they are no longer able to delegate. You can find these in the standard where it says, top management shall, followed by the requirement. In places where it says top management shall ensure, this means that they can still delegate, but let us look at what they must do themselves. Leaders are accountable and responsible for the prevention of injury and ill health and to provide a safe and healthy workplace. They must also communicate to all workers the importance of the management system and develop an occupational health and safety culture in the organization. They need to protect workers who report incidents and hazards to prevent reprisals and then establish occupational health and safety policy and objectives. This is not a full list of the, all the requirements placed on leaders, which we'll go into more on in our courses, but it gives you an idea of the, the switch in responsibility. So what are the implications for auditors and implementers with this switch? So for starters, the audit program will include internal audits of top management and could include CEO or managing director. <clears throat> so as auditors, you may have to audit someone on the highest level in your organization. For the implementers, it means they may need to assist top management to provide objective ed evidence of compliance and creating or updating communication channels and methods in order to allow top management to carry out their requirements. As an occupational health and safety manager, you may need to make top management aware of their responsibilities as their requirements, that there are requirements that they can no longer delegate. So one bit of news that might surprise you is that the role of the management representative has not been adopted by ISO 45001, but be aware it is a legal requirement in many countries, including the UK, to have a representative for health and safety. <clears throat> so we briefly mentioned workers, and we'll look at this concept a bit more now. ISO 45001 says that workers and all their representatives shall be, consulting, shall be, shall be consulted, meaning that their views are sought, and participate, meaning they are involved in decision making, in processes involving the occupational health and safety management system at all levels. So the definition of a worker is a person performing work or work related activities that are under the control of the organization. The work could be paid or unpaid, regular or temporary, full time, part time, seasonal or casual, meaning that all staff are included but also included in the notes to the definition are management and top management, contractors, subcontractors, external providers and agencies. So the definition is as wide as possible. Almost everyone is classed as a worker. Workers that are subject to risk when performing work-related activities for the organization 
form part of the management system context. So another big change is the introduction of risk-based thinking with regards to the management system. <clears throat> so this is consistent with Annex SL management system standards and considered essential to the success of the management system. The definition of risk is effect of uncertainty. And by effect, they mean a deviation from the expected in positive or negative direction. So as well as the business risk, there are occupational health and safety risks to be considered. It is defined as combination of the likelihood of occurrence of a work-related hazardous event or exposure and the severity of injury and or ill health that can be caused by the event of exposure. This affects the frequency of audits needed for the process, where high risk processes are audited more often than low risk. So effective risk-based thinking, meaning preventing things from going wrong in the first place, can prevent excessive corrective action. For organisations to plan and implement appropriate and adequate controls in the occupational health and safety management system, they first need to identify the risks and opportunities. Where 18,001 talks about preventative action, 45,001 no longer does that in quite the same way. Instead, the whole standard has become preventative in its approach by looking at risks. The organisation must show that it is determined considered and, where necessary, taken action to address any risks and opportunities that may impact the ability of the Occupational Health and Safety Management System to deliver its intended outcomes. But there are some new detailed corrective action requirements worth taking a look at. While 18,001 talks about documents and records, 45,001 talks about documented information. So let's look at what this means. Documented information is defined as information required to be controlled and maintained by an organisation and the medium on which it is contained. So the standard determines what documented information you need to maintain as a minimum for the management system. It also says you should keep documented information to a minimum to the extent necessary. So we don't want to create a system of documents, but rather a documented system. You get the point. Um, <clears throat> documented information may need to be maintained and or retained. So the difference being maintained information needs to be updated, while retained information is for safekeeping re and records. So some are both, and um, we're going to give you a few examples. So the occupational health and safety policy needs to be maintained. The occupational health and safety internal audit reports need to be retained. The occupational health and safety objectives need to be both maintained and retained. The documented information needs to be protected from loss of confidentiality and improper use. And you can see the relevance of this with the electronic data being the norm in many businesses now, an interesting and much needed change. <clears throat> so let's look at the requirements for injury and ill health. An organization must take into account factors with a potential to cause injury and ill health. This explicitly includes the mental and cognitive condition of people as well as their physical condition. So causes of ill health and injury can be immediate, so such as accidents, or they can be long-term, such as repeated exposure to harmful substances or a stressful working environment. But how can, can an organisation deal with hazards? So let's look at how we're able to control them. When looking at controls, we often place them in a hierarchy. So where the most effective is on top and for each step down, effectiveness decreases. So let's work our way from the top down. So you can eliminate the hazard by applying ergonomic approaches where, when planning new workplaces. So for example, creating physical separation of traffic between pedestrians and vehicles. 
so the hazard can be substituted so by replacing the dangerous by the non-dangerous for example replacing solvent based paint by water based paint you can implement engineering controls by taking protective measures such as isolation for example uh, machine guarding and ventilation systems you could use administrative controls by giving appropriate instructions to workers so for example entry control processes and forklift driving licenses and lastly you can provide personal protective equipment such as safety shoes and safety glasses PPE is the last resort in controlling hazards but but in practice it is sometimes used as a first response to a hazardous situation so this gives a little food for thought So those are the main headlines for ISO 45001, but what does all this mean for you and your organization now? So we'll give you some top tips for what you can do right now. Firstly, get top management buy-in, as their involvement is crucial for the management system. We find that this is where many organizations who have transitioned from ISO 9001 and 14001 have struggled. So get that one worked out quickly. On the management system side, you can start by defining organizational context, relevant interested parties and their requirements. Remember to consider external providers beyond just suppliers. So review your current process and controls and associated risks. Reinforce the adoption of the process approach and review the scope of current preventative actions. Reconsider management system documentation needs and start planning for migration training for auditors and awareness training for all staff. If you've already got 18001, you should consider advantages of integration with other standards such as ISO 9001 or 14001. If in your current system you have exclusions to 18001, then you need to reconsider those as 45001 doesn't allow for exclusions. So for all of you who are auditors, you will need to gain the ability to audit top management and get a wider understanding of organizational context and issues. When auditing, you're more likely to encounter integrated systems, so a wider range of standards under your belt might be beneficial. You need solid knowledge of the concepts in the new standard and you will need auditor migration training. So let's look at that right now. Organisations adopting the new standard will recognise the requirements from 18001 and should find the migration relatively easy. Many of our clients have integrated systems such as ISO 9001 for quality and ISO 14001 for environmental. So those of you who have these standards for a few years, you'll have gone through the transitions when the standards were updated in 2015. The migration for 45001 will work in a similar way. The migration period for auditors and organisations is three years from the publication. So this means your 18001 certification will not be valid after February 2021. Anyone using 18001 can migrate to 45001, and that includes auditors and organisations. Migration training will offer valuable skills for any auditor auditing against an occupational health and safety management system. Auditors holding an ERCA certification are required to successfully complete an ERCA certified ISO 45001 migration training course to keep their certification going. This must be completed within the three-year migration period. At Batalas, we offer the ERCA certified migration course, both as public and in-house courses. But please note, you don't have to be ERCA certified to actually do this course. Companies registered to 18001, including those with integrated systems, will have to update their management systems and be recertified by their certification body within the three-year migration period. An ERCA approved 45001 auditor migration course will consist of two days training covering Annex SL and auditor skills applicable to ISO 45001. It will teach you the requirements of the standard and how to audit against them. This is the, current, the, the course 
um, that the current 18,001 auditors will need. We also offer an ERCA approved 45,001 foundation training course. This is a one day course suitable to train anyone from staff level to top management in organizations implementing or intending to use 45,001. So those who need to know about the requirements of the standard. So in short, if you're currently auditing against 18,001, do the migration course. If you need to know about 45,001 requirements, then do the foundation course. For those with integrated systems, we offer IMS or internal auditor training. If you're unsure about the training you need or you've got specific requirements, then just contact us and we'll be able to help. So when to migrate? And, and this is a really good question. And there is a simple answer. Uh, it depends on when your next certification order is. So let me clarify on that. If you're due recertification this spring or early summer, you may be pushed for time updating your management system and getting people trained in time. So it'd be wise to consider 18,001 recertification now and migrate to 45,001 later in the three year period. However, if your recertification is due later this year or in 2019, you can certainly get the work done and have a new system in place in time, but you will need to start the work pretty soon. Your certification body will be able to offer the best advice on recertification timelines, so contact them, make a plan and start working towards the new standard. So you can call us to have a chat with our product specialists about your specific needs. We're here to help. You can trust our advice. Um, we're certainly not going to send you sell you any training that you don't need. Um, there are things you can do now. So get your copy of the new standard when it's out. Do a gap analysis for your management system. Then move on by increasing the awareness of the changes in your organization. You can speak to top management about it. Let them know how vast the changes are and their involvement in the new standards. Prepare them for the time and effort it will incur to migrate over. But remember, you're not alone. You can find information about migration training courses on our website or you can call us for advice. We'll also keep you up to date with information in our newsletter. So if you don't already receive these, then please register via our website. You can find um, the login um, at the bottom of our web page. You can also find news about ISO 45001 on our social media channels. So we've now come to the end of the presentation. I hope you found it helpful in giving an overview of this new occupational health and safety standard. And I'll now hand you back to Maria. Thank you, Elliot. That was a great presentation. Um, we will uh, be able to take questions on, on any of this that we've talked about today. So please just send us an email to uh, training at battleas.com. I will put up the, uh, there it is. There's the, the phone number, our website. You can chat with us there if you want to. We have a, a nice little uh, chat feature and you can email training at battleas.com for any questions about this or other training um, or give us a call. Um, we're all here to help. So um, it was lovely having you all here today. Um, and um, that's it. Um, we we'll just wish you good luck with your migration to 45,001. Thank you.